Simulation is a technique of applying different input stimulus to a design at different times to check if the RTL code behaves in the intended way. It's a well-followed technique to verify the robustness of a design, allowing us to view a timing diagram of related signals to understand how a design description in Verilog actually behaves. For combinational logic, this is mainly used for verification of functionality, but in registered logic, we can look at the synchronization of signals, data streams, and functions. So why do we need to simulate anything? Can't we just program it onto a chip and debug like we would do a microcontroller? Well, while a design may compile, that isn't a guarantee that it works correctly. Its functionality still needs to be verified. In embedded software design, we'd program our device and then use a debugger to step through the program and examine the variables as they change. However, FPGAs don't really have the same in-circuit debugging capabilities that microcontrollers do. It's not a sequential program on board, it's a physical circuit, so we can't just pause and examine everything that's going on. In theory, we could specify registers in the device to reflect the states of various signals and examine those, but that would use up valuable resources, and if our design is approaching the limit of our device, there's simply no scope for it. Second to this, if it's a large system, the compilation times are absolutely huge, so we wouldn't want to be recompiling after changing a couple of lines of code if the process will take three hours to finish. We only have to perform the analysis and elaboration stage of compilation to conduct functional simulation, as our simulation tools work off the generated circuit's netlist. Finally, simulation is a vital tool in the world of commercial FPGA design. Design houses creating complex IP cores want their products to be as versatile as possible, whilst providing a guarantee that they'll do what they're supposed to. These cores are handed off to developers to implement into undefined designs, and therefore the IP designers need to make sure that they will perform correctly in any given situation. Thus, each core is subject to a huge amount of simulation and testing across as many test cases as possible, so that they can safely say that the design's fit for purpose. In FPGA design, the simulation stage is incredibly important, and more often than not, longer than the design phase itself. In big design companies, you'll have several engineers whose jobs revolve entirely around testing and verification of other engineers' designs. As mentioned in the first lab session, there are two stages of testing within the design flow, functional simulation and timing simulation. The functional simulation stage is where the circuit is tested to verify that it performs its expected function. This doesn't require any knowledge of the hardware device that the design is targeted for, it's simply a performance check of the RTL. Once the functional simulation stage has passed, the implementation or placing and routing is conducted and the timing simulation can take place. The timing simulation ensures that the circuit performs as expected on a given hardware device. As we'll see in the next lab session, the practicalities of implementing large designs on hardware with an expectation of high performance mean that we have to take into account the propagation delay through the device primitives to ensure that our design stays synchronized throughout its lifetime. Timing simulation involves the use of mathematical models of specific device primitives, along with the route of signals through the design to determine an accurate estimate for the propagation delay of the signals between parts of the system. This isn't as simple as saying a lookup table has a 5 nanosecond delay and applying it to all logic elements in use, as changes to physical device properties such as temperature can cause slight variances in clock rates and conductivity, which can result in significant issues in synchronization. By running a well-modeled timing simulation and rearranging the physical implementation of the design to reduce unnecessarily long routes, these issues can be avoided, although sometimes extra logic is required to keep everything in sync. Due to time constraints in this module, we'll only be looking at functional simulation, as even scratching the surface of timing simulation would require a lot more knowledge that we just don't have time for to cover this semester. The functional simulation process takes place on a module-by-module -module basis, starting at the bottom of the hierarchy. So each of our modules should be simulated and verified before they use as a sub-module. This is so that we can detect where our issues lie in complex modules. If we don't simulate as we build and our first tests are run on complete, complex systems, it's going to take a significant amount of time to work out where any issues might lie. If our design is small, we can feasibly test all possible input combinations and look at the output waveforms to verify functionality, but in large designs this simply isn't feasible. For example, a 32-bit adder would have in the order of 10 to the power 19 different input combinations to test. And if we were to take just one nanosecond to test each one, we'd still be testing that same module 58 years later. 
So brute forcing is rarely the best option. Instead, we have to develop an efficient test schedule by determining the so-called critical cases. Critical cases are targeted test criteria determined by the desired functionality of the device being tested. So, for example, if you were testing a full adder, you'd want to be testing that it was capable of adding correctly, but you'd also want to specifically target conditions with more interesting potential results, such as too large numbers to generate a carry output. To determine our critical cases, we need a deep understanding of what the design being tested is expected to do. From there, we can extract a set of test criteria which will give an overall reflection of the module's function, whilst constraining the time taken for tests to be run. The test criteria can also include conditions reflective of the module being misused, so designers can idiot-proof their systems. For example, checking what happens in a divider unit if the system attempts to divide by zero. As mentioned previously, the design of a robust test schedule can easily take as long as the design of the system to be tested itself. Even then, when the designs are tested, the options for how rigorous they should be are almost endless. For these reasons, we need to rationalise the amount of testing that can be done. If you're an industry, there'll be a development schedule that you need to stick to, so the amount of testing conducted needs to be carefully balanced with the amount of time it will take. The subsequent determined set of tests to be performed is what's known as a test schedule. As a set of basic rules for the simple designs you'll be working on this semester, we need to ensure that during our tests, all wires have been toggled, all state machine transitions have occurred, and that every line of Verilog we've written has been executed. For more complex designs, a smart test schedule needs to be developed to be as robust as possible within the time frame available. There are three main approaches to this, directed, random, and constrained random testing. The idea of designing test schedules by identifying critical cases is an example of directed testing. In directed testing, the onus is on the designers to identify all possible critical cases and ensure that they're part of the schedule. However, while leaving it all up to the designers and their knowledge of the system ensures that all known critical cases are tested, it can't guarantee that none have been overlooked. To account for this, we can use techniques such as random testing, in which we'd throw randomised inputs at a design for as long as our timescale will allow, and examine the outputs for any issues. This scattergun approach is good for highlighting previously unknown, interesting or critical cases in complex systems, but also results in a lot of uninteresting cases, which could be seen as time wasted. In industry, it's common to use a hybrid of these two test types, known as constrained random testing. In constrained random testing, the test engineers will target random inputs to specific use cases of the system. So as opposed to just randomly toggling inputs and seeing the effect on an output, you'd use your knowledge of the module's desired function to apply random stimulus in the anticipation of a critical case. So let's take the ALU from last year as an example designed to be tested and establish a test schedule in our critical cases. We'll assume here that the arithmetic and logic units are part of a single ALU design module and haven't already been tested themselves. We know from designing the ALU last year that each opcode relates to a different function, so each of these functions will require testing. Our ALU is an undefined width, so we'll state that we need to test an unspecified range of values. We also want to check that nothing untoward happens and no weird results are generated if any incorrect opcode is passed to the system. Not only are we interested in the operation's results, but we also want to be making sure that the output flags are correctly triggered. From this, we can drive our test schedule. We want to test n value pairs for each opcode in turn to ensure the operations function as desired. Our critical cases are m value pairs, which are expected to trigger flags c, v, z, and n. Finally, we'll need o value pairs for each incorrect opcode function. So how do we determine n, m, and o? How many values should we be testing? Well, if our ALU is fairly small, say 8 bits or less, we could feasibly test all possible values. Testing every potential value pair for every possible opcode in an 8-bit version of this ALU would give us 1,048,576 different input combinations, which sounds absolutely huge, but if it took just 10 milliseconds to test a single set of inputs, the whole test schedule could be done in 3 hours. If we were to make the jump to a 16-bit ALU, however, we'd be looking at 22 years to test everything. So in that situation, doing some constrained random testing would definitely be the better option. 
So how do we actually develop these test schedules? As opposed to manually stimulating the circuit we want to test, we create a file known as a test bench, which is a self-contained module instantiating our design. This instance is known as the device under test. The test bench will include our input stimuli, either hand-selected or programmatically generated, along with some code to procedurally apply them to our device under test. The test bench then receives the output from the instance, which can be collected in a file by our simulation software to be verified by the test engineers. For simple designs and short, directed tests, it's feasible for test engineers to manually verify the results. They know what the critical cases are, and there might only be a few outputs, so any issues will become clear by plotting the data in MATLAB and looking at the results, or something similar. While this works for simple designs and short tests, however, we need a more robust solution for testing complex designs with large-scale random inputs. If the input is random, we don't know what the stimuli will be before the test is run. Therefore, we'd need to examine the generated input, work out the expected result with pen and paper, and compare it to the received output. This would be fine for small, simple designs, but it would get boring very quickly if you had to test a few hundred different input combinations for an FFT engine. This leads to the idea of developing a so-called golden model for the device under test. Golden models can be developed in any programming language and act as a simulator for an ideal working version of your design. Using some clever scripting, the test bench can pass the input stimuli to both the device under test and the golden model, and then compare the output of the two, automatically throwing up any cases which don't match. We perform these tests using a dedicated simulation tool. These tools are software packages which are exclusively used for simulation and testing. They allow designers to run test benches on their designs, applying the stimuli and monitoring the output. During this module, we'll be using a package called ModelSim, which is widely used within the digital design industry. It allows automated testing of incredibly complex designs for both verification and debugging process. For the rest of the semester, you'll be using ModelSim to debug your designs as you build them and simulate their expected function before they're implemented on a device. In ModelSim, we can monitor a design signals with respect to time and view them graphically, so we can quickly verify small combinational logic circuits and view the changing states of registered circuits with respect to clock cycles. The test procedures can also be monitored in progress, and a timescale of the design's functionality can be viewed graphically or logged to a console. ModelSim allows us to look at each module and submodule in our design and the wires, variables and registers contained within them. We can use ModelSim to manually stimulate our signals and view the results in the wave window, but as we've learned, this isn't the most efficient way to test our design. So before we start to simulate, we need to learn a bit more about test benches.